Uh, good morning, everyone. I guess I'll get started. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm here to talk to you today about the, an exciting development uh, brought to the 96 Boards team um, from LHG, which is the 96 Boards TV platform. I wanted to give you an overview of this platform, I talk about how it came into existence and uh, where we are, the status of the TV platform, and uh, essentially let everybody know that there is an enterprise, or sorry, a TV platform specification on the way. So I'll start with, first of all, an overview. Why do we feel that we needed a TV platform specification? We already had two um, enterprise specifications. Why did we think we needed to do something different? Um, how did the requirements we came up with compare? How did they compare with the consumer electronics specification board? Um, what were our requirements for the TV platform? How did we come to the conclusion that we should align with the Enterprise Edition form, um, board? And some of the hardware requirements for the TV platform. As I mentioned, we all show that we align with the Enterprise Edition. However, there are some uh, exemptions and modifications uh, to that specification for, to address some of the TV platform requirements. I'll give an overview of the TV platform board layout, software requirements, and some additional considerations for vendors who are looking to create a TV platform board. So the TV platform specification uh, follows the overarching goals of the 96 boards program, which is to provide ARM-based solutions that are low cost and readily available that in the case of LHG meet the needs of the developers in LHG as well as meet the uh, requirements for the larger commu development community. Uh, as you know, set-top boxes can address a range of design solutions. You can have home gateways that are fully featured, a lot of uh, peripherals and connectors on them, or you could have very small like OTT, IPTV type streaming boxes, like the, the Roku's, et cetera. So you, you, we're looking to create a specification that can accommodate a range of set-top box solutions. As usual, cost is a, an important uh, driver for the acceptance of these boards. We're looking at what I call a mid-range board to be something in the order under $50, hopefully we can get to that high 30s price point. When I say a mid-range board, I'm talking about a board that can typically do like 1080p video, maybe some 4K at lower frame rates with a, a mid-range graphics processor. For a higher end board, we wanna be sub $100 and we're looking at more fully featured types of designs that members or designers may want to bring. These could include 4K video, higher frame rates, um, more advanced codecs, HEVC, VP9, uh, more advanced uh, graphics processors. Again, it's a question of balancing the feature set with the cost. But typically you have like these mid-range type boards and then you, that are maybe like IP or TV clients, more the smaller form factor or sorry, smaller uh, amount of peripherals and things. And then you have a more fully featured gateway type feature or type of board that has um, a lot more power, powerful graphics um, and more advanced codecs. So as we started looking at the requirements for a TV platform board, we were comparing them with the consumer edition specification and the enterprise edition specification. And we found that as they were currently defined, we couldn't uh, make uh, a TV platform that would just follow directly with one of these um, already available consumer, uh, consumer ed uh, enterprise edition boards. So we started looking at what special things would be required for the TV platform. So I was mentioned the consumer edition board is a board that has a lot of the um, multimedia AV uh, 
formats supported or, or connectors already on the board. Uh, there were some things that were, you know, of course, very close to what we needed for the TV board, but there were some wrinkles or some things that were uh, a bit of an issue. We had some SOC designers who were using only set-top based SOCs in their designs, not mobile based SOCs, so these chips did not have uh, the mobile interfaces. Uh, they didn't have support for uh, display serial interface or camera serial interface. And so that was problematic for some uh, potential vendors. Um, they also have on the consumer edition board this high speed connector. Every 96 board will have the low speed connector. That's common to everything in 96 boards. But the consumer edition has this high speed connector that we didn't really see a need for in, in our uh, TV platform designs. Uh, a lot of set-top designs prefer to have a dedicated Ethernet port on them. As you know, on the consumer edition, you can have Ethernet through the USB connector. Um, but again, some like to have the Ethernet and UARTs like directly on the board instead of having a UART available just say through the, a low speed connector. The size of the consumer edition, there, there's two form factors for the consumer edition. One is the small credit card size and that form factor was essentially too small to add other you know, types of peripherals um, that you, you, know, you may want to have uh, additional audio type uh, connectors, other networking connectors or audio video connectors and there was really not much space left on that board. The consumer edition though does have the expanded uh, fo uh, footprint um, which is almost double the size of the credit card uh, platform but it's again there are some inconveniences having the low speed connector in the middle of the board and again um, we were concerned that to accommodate the whole range of solutions we wanted, the, the size of the board itself would still be an issue. All right, okay, so um, again, so we gave the CE spec, uh, uh, you know, a very careful, uh, in, you know, look and we decided it's just not quite, it wasn't quite what we needed. Um, So we started developing our own uh, requirements for the TV platform board. So what I did um, is I started. So is this, okay, yeah, I can hear it. All right, so what I did was uh, in late summer of 2015, I looked at a lot of boards that were out on the market, um, Raspberry Pi 2, like the all-winner QB4, NVIDIA, the uh, Android um, dis uh, development terminal board, and as well we had reference boards from our LHG members such as ST Micro with their B2020, also High Silicon with uh, one of their boards. So what I did is I kind of took a, a look at all of these boards and I came up with an initial list of requirements. With those requirements, I then started working with our steering committee. So this was all initiated prior to the formation of the 96 boards team. And so, like I said, it was done late summer, early fall of 2015 when I started thinking LHG really needs um, a development platform that we can give to all of our developers and also have adopted by the, the wider community. One thing I wanted to specify here is that we're, de we're creating a development board. We're not creating a product. Uh, some people will say, oh, the size of the board should be more like this or that. It, that doesn't, that's not really the goal here. We want to create a board that developers can use. It's flexible. You can use it for a range of set-top designs. It's not like this board is going to actually just be plopped into a product. That's really not the, the, end, the end goal. TV platform, like all the other 96 boards, as the name implies, support can be used with, like, you can have designs for 32-bit SOCs or 64-bit SOCs. Um, again, I'm stressing the flexibility of the platform to accommodate these different designs. 
I had a few iterations with my steering committee with the, the requirements set. They took these requirements back to their hardware teams. After a few iterations, we settled on what we believed that, you know, were the right requirements. And then the next step was to determine out of that requirement set which one should be mandatory, which one should be optional. So we went through this exercise in the fall of 2015. And then uh, essentially things, all the requirements settled down. And then I took those requirements into Lenaro. And at the time, the 96 boards team was started up and Yang came on board. So we started talking internally about the best way to implement this. And the decision was made that the Enterprise Edition board would serve as a good baseline for this TB platform spec. So um, the, the Enterprise Edition board is, you know, on purpose, was designed to be very flexible. It's, it's a fair sized board. There's a lot of room to add peripherals. You can essentially start with that core uh, baseline of the Enterprise Edition spec and then add all of the components that you need to make a, you know, your, your TV platform board. There's a lot of flexibility for I.O. Um, we didn't want to create another new edition. We didn't want to fragment the 96 boards program more by trying to define a TV edition board. We wanted to, as George discussed in the keynote, we had the consumer edition, enterprise edition, and the, the light edition. We think that the enterprise edition board satisfies the needs of LHG. It also satisfies, obviously, the needs for the enterprise group and most likely the networking group as well. So after a few revisions, discussions, we came up with the first draft of the TV platform specification in December of 2015. We then started talking with our LHG members and looking for um, what we call some of our first lead partners to work on the board. Um, what typically happens is that before the specification is officially released, we like to have at least one lead partner go through the specification, uh, look for, you know, kind of do a vetting of it, see if there's anything problematic so we don't have to, you know, start revving the spec right, right off the bat. So we're working with a lead partner right now on the TV platform board. And uh, once we, you know, there may have to be some minor tweaks, but we're not really expecting anything. If everything is fine, then we will, the 96 boards team will release the specification. So this is essentially a diagram that came from Yang and George showed something. Um, I just wanted to re reiterate it, that the E specification is the common baseline. And you can see here that the E specification can satisfy the LNG, LHG, and LEG um, requirements. And then you see the CE is well suited to mobile. And of course, then the new light spec, the, um, Okay, so again, that's the range of, I'll call them additions, and then on like 96 boards, you can then have uh, variations of the enterprise edition that uh, work for these other three segment groups. So just talk about a, 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 some of the highlights of the hardware requirements. For those of you who are familiar with the enterprise edition spec, the standard form factor is 160 by 120 millimeters. The requirement is for a minimum of one gigabyte of RAM. We recommend two. Um, the flash, again, the minimum recommendation, or the minimum in the spec is eight gigabytes. Um, we think that's sufficient. We have seen some higher end boards that do go up to 16, but uh, we think eight is, is probably a good place. We add Wi-Fi to the TV platform spec, so that is a requirement um, it, on top of the Enterprise Edition spec. Minimum of 802.11 GNN, recommend AC. Minimum of 2.4 gigahertz. You can have five gigahertz as well. Mark, but are you mandating bits to solder down RAM? Well, we're, yeah, we're not recommending the, the use of the small outline dims or anything like that. Most set-top boxes are, um, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Bluetooth uh, is, is an option, and would, if you implement it, uh, it should be Bluetooth Low Energy 4.0. Again, that, that is optional. The output display uh, requirement is for HDMI, uh, minimum 1.4, most likely 2.0, recommended HDCP 2.0 minimum, again, most likely 2.2. Um, I think something, you know, you can get 4K video around 30 frames per second with a fairly modest board. Again, higher end designs can go up to 60, uh, 60 frames per second at 4K. Um, the HDMI location is fixed on this. Uh, if you're doing a TV card, you, instead of having an HDMI, you may have an HDMI in. Again, that would be an option. Uh, optional video connectors, um, even though they seem to be disappearing, there are still some people who like to have some analog connectors, uh, composite component S-video, but these are, uh, kind of losing favor, everything is sticking pretty much with digital interfaces. But again, there's room on the board if you choose to do that, if you want to target perhaps a very low end market. Um, again, Ethernet is something that's in the, on the Enterprise Edition spec, um, RJ45. Audio, the, the mandatory is the HDMI audio, but we expect that uh, vendors or designers will include um, stereo Io, stereo audio jacks, and potentially could have um, digital interfaces, the SPDIF interface, uh, perhaps. Again, these are all things that uh, a designer may want, always balancing you know, the, the equation of functionality and cost. As I mentioned, the low speed connector, the 40 pin low profile, is mandatory across every uh, 96 board design, and of course, um, that's mandatory here, and the location is fixed. Some other TV platform options, user input, you could have IR detector for remote control. You may have something more uh, advanced, like an RF4CE uh, support for voice activated remote controls. Um, voice activation remote controls are really starting to gain popularity in North America on the Comcast uh, X1 platform. It's one of their most popular features. So RF4CE uses Zigbee. Again, it's, it's, it's wide open. You can, the designers can decide what they want to put. There's enough space on the board. It's up to them to determine what they want to put in their, their designs. You may, depending on your, what you're doing for security, you may want to have a smart card interface. Again, that would be an option. Some members discussed the need or the desire to have uh, transport stream parallel interface connectors so they could connect a, a tuner card, be a DVB tuner, terrestrial cable, or what have you, and then be able to plug it into um, a parallel interface. So that option is there as well. And so as I mentioned, there are some variances that uh, we negotiated <laughs> in, the, in our discussions with the uh, team that you know, seemed reasonable. As, as some of you may be aware, the Enterprise Edition actually has two power connectors, a uh, low power and a high power connector. We believe for the set-top solution, you really only need the low power connector up to 80, 90 watts. So um, we've made the high power connector optional. Uh, there was some language in the Enterprise Edition spec about separate boot ROM, 64-bit uh, separate boot ROM. In the set-top space, people may decide to boot from flash, or if they do have a separate boot ROM, we're not holding them to the 64-bit, uh, or sorry, 64 megabit um, mandatory requirements. The Ethernet connector is fixed on the Enterprise Edition to be at the front, but we're thinking that typically the groupings of network and AV connectors are all typically all put in one line, but uh, you know, typically on the back edge, so there's some flexibility as to where you put the Ethernet connector. So here's a, 
you know, the, the board layout. This is for people who are familiar with the enterprise specification, the standard format. This is, um, you know, you've, you've seen this before. The areas in the light blue are optional. So you see at the top right, the high speed or the high power connector is, is optional. You see the low speed connector fixed, you know, that its location uh, you know, can't move. Actually, the ethernet is allowed to be moved at the back. There is one USB port that we're keeping at the front. I've shown here an example of um, an IR detector for user input from a remote control. Uh, the idea here is that I put it over to the left side because if somebody puts a mezzanine board and perhaps there's a small ribbon cable or something, it could perhaps uh, block the line of sight. So I was suggesting just to get it out of the way, put it off to the side. Uh, the area that's in shaded, the top left, is where we expect the designers to put their complement of networking and audio video connectors, as I mentioned, um, if they want to have audio or SPDIF or, or what have you. Now, there's a, there's a, a lot of real estate there. You see the HDMI connector fixed at that location. There is an optional PCIe that you can have, but if, if you decide you're not going to have PCIe, you may want to use that left side edge if you want to do a tuner card or something like that. So again, that was one of the reasons, as I've gone over that, we, you know, why we chose the enterprise board. It's, it allows you a lot of flexibility. It's a development board. Designers can uh, come up with a range of solutions, and they can all be used on one board. Well, I also have the locations here for if you have the Wi-Fi LEDs down here. The, the user LEDs are, sta are standard, but if you have Wi-Fi or if you have the Bluetooth option of specified locations for those LEDs. If you wanted to put in a smart card interface, you can see where the blue, you may want to put that on the under, underside of the board. Again, these are, these are options, but there's enough space on that board to uh, do pretty much whatever you would like. The software requirements, the core software requirements align with what's in the 96 boards specification for CE and EE. Um, you know, the kernel, typically either you know, a Google supported Android kernel or one of the latest LTS kernels or one of the LSK kernels based on LTS is expected to, you know, to be supported. Did a stable release of one of the TV platform designs of Android, Debian, Ubuntu, et cetera. Uh, Lennar or vendor support U Linux using open embedded Yocto is important. It's especially important for LHG, for the Linux-based work we do. We, we focus on open embedded Yocto builds uh, for our open SDK, for example. Boot architecture is important, um, having at least one open source implementation available. What's also important to LHG is support for a secure execution environment, um, having an unlocked bootloader so we can use OptT. All of the work we're doing in LHG is based on OptT security. The DRM integrations we're doing with OptT uh, you know, make it necessary for, for us anyway to have OptT support. Um, support for ARM trusted firmware, ARM V8 on 64-bit designs. Um, it's very important to have secure boot. Uh, accelerated graphics support. Again, these are common. The graphics drivers have to be fully supported with open source code or royalty-free binaries. And we expect the vendors of these boards to provide these updated binary drivers to support uh, these kernel features. So like I, I've already alluded to some of these additional considerations, ARM trusted firmware and OPT support are important to the group. Um, from a testing perspective, um, you know, from Tyler's group, they like to have boards that can be automatically powered up, uh, power cycling, uh, return to the bootloader stage without manual intervention. They like to be able to have network boot capability. Anything that can, you know, works well in lava 
where you don't have to go in and manually you know, reset boards. They like everything to be done uh, remotely or automatically. So that's, I think, an important consideration for a board designer. That goes across the board pretty much for all, all of the uh, 96 boards. Uh, GPUs in general, uh, or ARM Malian specific, uh, specifically, for example, in, in LHG, we use Whalen Weston, we use kernel features, DRM KMS, uh, DMA buff. We like to have that support in, in the GPUs. On our Mali GPUs, the, the more recent family of the what they call the, the Midgard family, T600, 700, 800, support these features. Uh, we have a bit of a challenge sometimes getting all those features uh, on the lower end of, of the, uh, the older 400, 450 libraries. So sometimes we need some additional support from ARM. Uh, we're, we're at a place that we can work with the older you know, Mali libraries. But again, in terms of a design consideration, uh, this is the type of functionality uh, that we like to have you know, for, for LHG, the LHG work. Again, logical grouping of connectors, I've talked about that. Anything requiring line of sight, um, how you want to have access, um, any frequently accessed switch buttons or something should be usually on an edge or something so people can, if they have to, uh, can easily access them. Power management is one area for uh, some people looking at EAS and Big Little. Uh, you may want to uh, consider having uh, the right pro again, these are development boards. Having probes for power measurements is something that, if, if working with big little designs is something important to you, you may want to ensure that you have the ability to make these power measurements. I think the, the, there will be some um, more formal power ma management requirements coming out soon. So, uh, so yeah, on the base spec, we are looking at uh, what, I mean, in the current existing base enterprise specification, we do have power management uh, capability, but um, uh, not in its best, uh, uh, most, uh, you know, unambiguous term, I should say. So, th so that's an area where we're trying to look into, um, be more specific, uh, for example, board level of a, Power rail measurement uh, capability and the SOC level of power management, uh, power management capability. But again, this is some areas we could look to uh, provide recommendation, but some areas there are practically impossible to make because uh, uh, the power rail does vary from SOC implementation to SOC. And so I think that's pretty much all I had. Um, again, we're looking to you know, get a, um, a release, I think maybe in the second quarter, we'd be hopefully looking to have the spec. And I just want to mention that you know, this work was initiated you know, in LHG before the 96 boards was uh, formally um, started up. And so the 96 board team owns the spec. Of course, LHG helped initiate it, but it, as with all the other boards and the software releases, reference releases, that will all go through uh, Yang's team, uh, 96 boards. So when the specs get updated or released, uh, essentially it's all <laughs> under his control. So, so, um, so obviously that uh, the family of hardware specification are defined within 96 board team to serve, uh, satisfy the segment group requirement. So none of those specs were designed uh, in isolation to, because that's no point. The whole point is to be able to design uh, low-cost hardware which satisfy, tailored to each different segment group requirement, uh, which including the three base spec, uh, IE edition, uh, CE edition, enterprise edition. And right now we actually have draft for both network platform uh, tailored for LNG requirement and also TV platform tailored for LHG requirement, and both of them based in the uh, EE edition as a base. Um, so that one from the hardware point of view, as Mark just mentioned, uh, the target for us is to be able to finalize release a spec working with our lead partner, 
and um, to have the you know the first low cost platform for LHG development usage as soon as possible. Uh, we know there are multiple party interested in, but we, we want to work with the lead partner to get the hardware out uh, in developers' hand and also community's hand. Now, software specification is slightly different. So Mark has actually gave a very good capture of the requirement in terms of what need to go into for the uh, LHG reference software platform. So the execution of the uh, LHG reference software platform will be a cooperation between 96 board to build and baseline LHG segment group pretty much go through entirely narrow engineering stream, multiple teams. So that is a collaborative effort by default. Um, and also actually not just a core engineering, but also members of the landing team. And uh, uh, so we are expecting that to be collaborative effort, but that will, uh, will be, you know, make attempt to lead that effort. But it is definitely a, a, a cross, cross team effort. So that is uh, what we call LHG reference platform build to hopefully provide a reference point of implementation and delivering all the good engineering work LHG segment group as well as the rest of the NARA core engineering team has been worked on. Thanks, Hearing. Okay, so that's it. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, Bert. Yes, there, there can be like a uh, either open embedded Linux or OEOCTO builds, or you can have Android builds. The, the, the so both software platform will right. be Yes, yes. We, we plan to do our Android work as well as the. Another question okay. is, Another question is uh, about the TV, since this is a TV platform. I think the traditional TV, uh, analog TV or digital TV might heavily dependent on uh, hardware, the vendor hardware. So what are you going to manage that uh, TV program or the TV operations? It's, uh, it's, it's something like Google TV, the, the Android TV, they have a TV input framework to manage the TV hardware. So. So in that LHG reference software platform, that how, how are we going to manage that hardware? Well, I think that's you know, a separate implementation of software versus like, you know, the, the spec that we're providing here today. So um, one of the, um, you know, the way things are moving right now is that people consume television content from their cable provider, satellite provider, some even terrestrial as well as IP, uh, you know, adaptive streaming sources. Um, in Android TV, they've, they've come up with this TV input framework to kind of combine all these sources so that when a user is looking at an EPG or available content, they see everything that's available. The, the actual physical delivery of that, if it's QAM or terrestrial or you know, broadband, is, is abstracted away from the user um, through the TV input framework, uh, we see that um, on Android TV and I think on other um, platforms that that's the direction that everyone's going in. So I, I don't think there's anything on this board that precludes you from doing that, but that is, you know, again, the software implementation that you choose to do. So if you have a variety of um, audio video connectors or for input, um, that's part of either if it's Android or however you decide to implement it. It's, it's up to you know, the software you know, to, to handle that if that's a type of feature set that you want to provide. So we, we must have an interface. Right, and again, TV input framework is one, but it um, doesn't mean that um, LHG at some point maybe could come up with something like that on Linux, for example. But I don't think any of that is precluded by the specification. Uh, so, so I want to add a couple points to the question. Uh, first, uh, to first answer to your first question that regarding 
whether in the LHG reference platform build we'll be doing open embedded in Yocto. So the answer is definitely yes. And in fact, if you look at uh, the reference platform build which just released before this connect, uh, we already enabled uh, Yocto overlay and um, we already have open embedded build for one particular uh, hardware. And uh, it is our intention because we understood that open embedded in Yocto is an important initiative for LHG members. So it is intended that is, you know, is in the planning. Now, for the second question, uh, if I understand the question correctly, you are referring to such as uh, Android input framework for TV, right? So, yes, that's something we actually have considered when we put the hardware together. I'll give you a specific example. Uh, there is a uh, requirement in the Android input TV framework calling out for a building tuner. Uh, this is something which you can add into the board. The TV spec, hardware spec has not, you know, excluded any possibility as such. It is up to designer's choice. All we have done is to specify a minimum functionality which you will recommend all the 96 board compliant hardware to be able to provide. And if, you know, Android TV is what you're going for, and by all means, you know, provide a building tuner as optional features on the board and uh, support Android TV, you know, TIF framework and from software and uh, going through the LHG, you know, if that's uh, something which you would likely narrow and the LHG, the rest of the members to be able to collaborate on and also software front and going through the normal channel from the software support point of view. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about tuners in the sense that one of the characteristics of 96 boards has been the mezzanines and the additional boards you can drop on. Um, and I would be very disappointed if we're not at least in a position to recommend a standardized way to attach to tuners, particularly when we're a virtual company. Uh, we all work in different spaces where the actual, you can't stick a tuner on the board because they only work in North America. <laughs> There was the idea of these TV, you know, these tuner cards, for example. Um, I, I guess at this point we're not um, enforcing anything. We're, we're leaving things, you know, open. I don't know about dates, but I would like to see in a position to recommend uh, a particular connect, like the low speed connect, I think, because it's capable of it, if there were recommended pins in the channel. I see. We can certainly make a recommendation where appropriate and relevant. As I uh, must admit, this is, is, uh, this is an area which I looked uh, a lot into, both in terms of option with tuner card and external ones and built-in ones, which is specified by the TIF. But uh, I think if it is, it is something where HG feels, uh, members feel very strongly, uh, we're happy to accommodate and make a recommendation of a standardized connector. Um, uh, so you said LHG. LHG. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But let's pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> so, so yes. I mean, obviously, the community. I mean, we are certainly uh, we're very interested in serve as well. If there is a vendor willing to provide, uh, we are. You know, we can make a recommendation. But I will certainly not recommend to make it a mandatory at this point. But I, I mean, I completely got, uh, got your point. But th this is some balance we have to actually. Uh, we have to look at at pre pretty much every spec, you know, between the segment needs and the community, and also sub-community within communities, <laughs> different requirements. But um, I, I think the attempt, the attempt is not here to make a perfect hardware. The attempt here is to make a really usable and useful and uh, low-cost hardware platform to able to allow us making to the next step. Well, we, you know, the spec itself, I have to make this point, the spec itself is a starting point, it never a stopping point. We never said any spec here is dead in the water, fixed from this point to eternity. And in fact, we actually have uh, put in a place right now to allow the spec to evolve itself, but just not changing like every, 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 every other day.
Um, to connect the two, we, we only need TS pins, isn't it? That's all. Oh, oh yeah. Huh? And I yeah, I to see. Yes. So um, recommending extending a LS connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the, the main difference between the, the TV platform and the traditional maybe phone platform, I think, is the uh, DMAX and the tuner, right? I didn't see any particular mention about the DMAX part. And the, in terms of the hardware architecture, I think there's a special consideration of connecting DMAX to the video decoder with the maybe audio, so for performance benefits. So this is for the hardware side comments. And the... Uh, the companion parts for regarding software is, uh, I didn't follow the NJT framework recently, so I'm not sure how much it has covered recently. For example, like passing the system information like legacy, uh, and also provide uh, the EPG library. I think those are two pieces of work possibly we can do in help kind of improve the Android TV platform. And also, I think the, we, we intended to cover many operating systems like uh, Android, Yocto, or even Bell Linux, right? But I think we should have some focus. Uh, basically, to go to the GUIs, for example, let's look at how the main TV SOC provider, what is the operating system they are using, and how we can help them improving their kind of work to, because previously, in initially, lots of uh, vendors or silicon vendors go with the Linux, and when there comes up the Android, people extend Android at a kind of TV service in order to uh, tune a tuner, get the system information, and present in the EPG. And I think this is part of work we can do in terms of upstream the software and uh, how help to improve the uh, software package generally. So you're, you're addressing the handling of, of the, all of the um, EPG data, the, the uh, tuning aspects, the uh, presentation. Yeah. Right. Okay, point taken. I think that you know that's something that uh, is, is expected in terms of operation of a set-top box. But you can always look for ways to more efficiently uh, you know, handle um, uh, PSI, SI tables, or and things like that. So uh, through the uh, section filtering, DMUX, and all that you know, kind of operations. I see. I see. Okay. Good point. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, as part of your reference software release, what are the d d different DRM stacks do you plan to support? Like, you have, you have Widevine, you have um, PlayReady, and so there are different options. Right. So, uh, we, we adhere to W3C EME, and like, and then for your media, the, the media source extensions, but then we integrate with Opti. Uh, we're looking at Widevine. We've done a PlayReady integration already with Opti. We're working with the PlayReady porting kit uh, version 3.0, which is re-architected for T support. We've done this complete integration with Opti already. We're working on the secure data path piece right now. We're looking at trusted applications for um, you know, you know, pr further down the road for like HDCP. But uh, at this point, we're looking at Widevine and PlayReady. I think we cover a pretty large swath with, with those two. Um, again, we, we have some members who are interested in doing play ready on Android. Um, we can um, migrate our, um, we, we have the play ready libraries already encapsulated in a TA. We, we believe we can, we can just migrate that to the Android space on Opti. Um, have the, on, on Android, we support the, or we intend to support the, um, you know, the plug-in DRM framework. Uh, we've been working with Microsoft on their uh, Android specification, 
Uh, we've already, of course, done the port or the integration with Microsoft on Linux. We, like I say, W3C EME, we've been using the open CDM approach on Linux, but on Android, when we speak with the Google folks, they want to be EME compliant, but they're not interested in um, uh, more interoperability with open CDM is not something that we intend to use, we'll go through libdrm on Android. So we, we have, um, you know, essentially widebind Android on, on sorry, widebind PlayReady on Android and then PlayReady on, on uh, Linux right now, all with Opti. That's why I was saying the bootloader is important so that we can, we can use Opti. So uh, some of the uh, reference software stack will have proprietary um, TAs and, uh, and while Linaro works on more open uh, kind of environment. So how does that uh, pan out? So what we can do is like with W3CME, we can do clear key solutions. You know, they're, essentially that adheres to the EME specification. However, if you're a member of Linaro and you're already a PlayReady licensee or a Widevine licensee, you can have access to the code that we create. So, like I said, the trusted application for PlayReady, if, if you're a licensee, yes, you can use our code. And so we have the interface is done, we have the PlayReady support, so I think that's a real uh, benefit to our members to be able to take that. Hello. As you mentioned in the software requirement for the TV platform, uh, put, put a firmware, we have two choice, U-Boot and UEFI. And uh, uh, I want to know which one is more recommend to apply on the TV platform. Uh, yeah, as you know, the set-top box space has been uh, primarily U-Boot. Uh, um, OEMs have indemnification issues uh, for pay TV, so a lot have, you know, there's, it's a heavily proprietary space with a lot of U-Boot, you know, but we have uh, initiative in place to start working with, uh, like the RDK, for example, doing reference UFI solutions. Um, so that's one, we think that we want to start promoting UFI as um, you know, getting past the first stage bootloader and uh, then having more uh, flexibility. An, an operator such as Comcast or others like to be able to have more vendors compete for their business and they think that if they can add more standardization to the boot process, it, um, you, know, after, you know, with UEFI for example, people can still do different extensions with UEFI but they can have a core common um, implementation that is easier for their integration when they go from vendor to vendor. Um, I don't know, Yang, did you want to make a comment? Um, so, so, so that's a very, very good question, so thank you for that. Um, um, you're right, so right now what so we have provision that for the LHGRPB for the bootload uh, supporting UEFI and U-Boot, which will be part of the reference software uh, platform boot architecture unification efforts. Uh, however, we we understand a lot of implementation in terms of the SOC enablement are done on the bootloader stage, done in new boot. We do want to point out that uh, we have uh, a preference in the long term or middle term to long term goal is to use the UEFI as our pref preferred so just, uh, recommendation if you like. And uh, in fact, the UEFI will be our uh, reference uh, implementation as well. Um, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, but we do understand uh, the practicality that in the short term we might have to enable the U-boot as an uh, acceptable option. But I mean, this is not just in terms of the standard, but it's also actually quite in the, in, in the LHG con and, you know, domain. This is actually uh, it's a direct matter of security. As uh, you know, some of the keynote has happening yesterday also point out this is uh, also the, for the reason of security, but UEFI is a preferred recommendation from our point of view. All right, uh, thank you everyone. I think I'll, uh, Yang and I will be available here. I think there's you know, coffee at the back, so if you want to have any further questions, please, you know, we're available here, but I think we have to give up the room soon. So thank you very much for your attention and your questions. <laughs>